Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are located in the world. Um, to those that participated in our poll, thank you. Uh, it's good information. Um, at SRE, we want to serve and provide the information that is relevant to you and your facility. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, today's webinar is the second in a series of webinars that are going to be put on by SRE. The first was presented in May and dealt with um, process simulation, more specifically dynamic simulation modeling of a sulfur recovery unit by way of VMG SIM. Um, for those that might be interested in receiving a copy of that webinar, um, please email me or visit our website where there is an easy form to fill out in order to request that webinar. Um, dynamic modeling is a very powerful tool, um, especially for facilities um, that might encounter issues with declining H2S content in their feed streams. Um, in general, sulfur recovery potential is a function of total H2S or more specifically sulfur that is introduced to your SRU and also an extremely valuable tool um, in advance of considering um, capital projects with respect to revamps or retrofits of your units. Again, for more information, please email me or fill out the simple form on our website, sulfurrecovery.com. Today's webinar, um, we will discuss the operating principles and design best practices of close condensers. Um, we will talk about sulfur, specifically accumulation in the process and how that could impact our potential sulfur recovery levels when operating, and also some of the problems and challenges, if you would, associated with safe and effective SRU shutdowns and startups. And problematic in terms of if not properly flushed from the system, we expose ourselves to the risks and issues associated with sulfur fires. Again, thank you for attending. My name is Ryan McLennan. I'm a lead process engineer with Sulfur Recovery Engineering, and just very happy that you took the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, I conducted this same webinar earlier today at 5 a.m. our time in Calgary, Canada. Um, it took about 45 minutes. Um, there, we had some very good questions at the end that I will address, and if more. Um, if more is required, we will pick that up via email offline, but uh, there will be ample time to ask any questions that you want. On your webinar panel, there is a, there is a, a button to type in your questions. There's been several questions already, and I promise to address those at the end of the presentation. A quick overview of the Klaus process, the conventional way industrially to convert extremely dangerous and toxic gas, H2S, to elemental sulfur, which is much more safe and hopefully um, at times is a very valuable product. Um, H2S that is fed to the SRU comes by way of the upstream amine unit where we where we generate a stream that is rich in h2s we hope and hopefully has less proportion of co2 at refineries there is most refineries also feed a stream called the sour water acid gas uh, in general this stream is composed of equal parts of h2s ammonia and water and i'll share a picture further along in the presentation where um, inadequate destruction of ammonia in refineries can be extremely problematic with respect to the performance of the sulfur recovery unit. In the reaction furnace, 
we burn a portion of the total H2S fed to the plant and form SO2, such that downstream in the photo represented as the catalytic section, in our catalytic reactors packed with catalyst, we react two molecules of H2S and one molecule of SO2 to make sulfur in the vapor phase. The close reaction itself is a gas phase reaction and we'll discuss as we move forward but the reaction itself is equilibrium limited so depending on what we do and how we influence the reaction we could move it to the left or we can move it to the right we want to move it to the right because we want to convert h2s to sulfur the importance of this slide is that from a control perspective we want to add an appropriate amount of combustion air at the front end in the furnace such that downstream we have the right amount of h2s and so2 an ideal optimized ratio of two to one for those for those that live in a world where you where you think of an air demand signal a two to one h2s to so2 ratio corresponds to an air demand signal of zero an extremely important control point, really the most important control aspect with respect to optimized operations of the sulfur recovery unit. Close condensers. In the catalytic reactors or converters, we carry out the Klaus reaction and we make sulfur vapor. The reaction itself is a gas phase reaction and the reaction is also equilibrium limited. The product that we are concerned with is the production of sulfur vapor. Close condensers serve to convert that sulfur vapor to liquid sulfur and remove it from the process. The reaction itself is equilibrium limited. The importance here is that we want to convert as much of the sulfur vapor as we can in the condensers as liquid and remove it from the process such that the remainder gas hopefully low in sulfur vapor content heading to the next catalytic stage will set up and refavor if you would the Klaus reaction such that we can push the overall conversion of H2S and SO2 towards sulfur and take that to the next level so by removing the liquid sulfur in the condenser we essentially trick equilibrium you can never defeat equilibrium but we we trick equilibrium and we make the klaus reaction more favorable again in the next catalytic stage um, the next point above dew point operation um, the process gas that we're dealing with or that's introduced to the condenser is a mixture it is not 100% sulfur vapor. And now when we're dealing with, um, with mixtures, things are different. There will be a specific temperature upon which the sulfur in that stream will condense. Now, we don't want to operate so cold such that we are forming solid sulfur. Such So as a result, we will never get complete or 100% recovery of all the sulfur vapor introduced at that moment into the condenser. Um, very common problem or challenge at many operating facilities is, um, you know, in terms of dealing with avoiding solidification. Um, liquid sulfur that's formed uh, in the condenser drops out and uh, bridging can occur at the outlet. Um, very common challenge, as we'll see as we move along in the presentation, temperature control of sulfur is so imperative. And, um, you know, sulfur is not exactly like water, but we'll discuss that as we move forward. The picture here is excellent. As you see, that is not liquid sulfur, that is solid sulfur. Um, any solidification that occurs in a condenser will inevitably impact the amount of process gas that we can move through that condenser unit.
since we will not have 100% recovery of all sulfur vapor to liquid in a condenser, there will inevitably be a degree of sulfur vapor that is carried over to the next catalytic stage. Um, on the y-axis of this plot, you will see sulfur in the vapor form on the y-axis. As we follow each curve down, we see a temperature in degrees centigrade. Specifically, this is our final condenser temperature. We will see that at 165 degrees centigrade, we have approximately 1.8% sulfur vapor carryover. As we move down all the way to 120 degrees centigrade, we reduce that to maybe 0.25% sulfur vapor carryover or loss. Now, the melting point of pure sulfur is approximately 115 to 118 degrees centigrade. As a result, you will never see a final condenser, or we shouldn't, that is operating at 100 degrees centigrade. We like to have a buffer zone. Um, our recommendations typically to clients is to, to minimize sulfur vapor carryover out of the SRU. Um, try to achieve a temperature of 130 degrees centigrade, or more specifically, or sorry, on the other hand, that's about 260 to 265 degrees Fahrenheit. The picture on the left shows condenser tubes that have formed and not release their liquid sulfur. They have, the sulfur here has solidified and it looks like it has baked. This is not good for performance. For those working at refineries, I mentioned earlier that refineries, most refineries also process an additional feed stream from the sour water unit that contains equal parts of H2S, ammonia and water. Um, it is absolutely imperative that we destroy as much of the ammonia as we can in the reaction furnace, because if we don't, there is the potential as we move downstream and cooler in the process that ammonia salts can form. They will set up on the condenser tubes and inevitably impact heat transfer. Um, if we impact heat transfer, we, we could impact overall sulfur recovery levels. We will be less effective at condensing sulfur vapor to sulfur liquid. And if the salting gets too bad, it will impact the amount of gas that we can put through a condenser or more specifically process in the unit overall. Um, best practices suggest, and also from our field testing experience, suggest that the residual levels of ammonia after the reaction furnace with an appropriate reaction furnace temperature, we should have ammonia residuals less than 150 parts per million. Uh, feel free to email me or write a question in the question tab um, if you would like to discuss uh, you know, the implications of uh, incomplete ammonia destruction uh, in more detail. Close condenser design, um, typically shell and tube heat exchanger, uh, processed gas is cooled by way of introducing, most facilities introduce boiler feed water and produce a low pressure steam, something like 50 pounds. Uh, some condensers, some condensers imply, um, some condensers introduce a low pressure steam and make a higher quality steam and uh, different condensers utilize some type of heating medium, a glycol, um, to take away the heat and help with the condensing of sulfur vapor to liquid. The most important aspect on this diagram is to the right-hand side, a demister pad. Demister pads serve to help knock down any sulfur vapor or droplets that may form in the condenser tube such that they are not carried over or more specifically, such that we limit 
as best we can the amount of carryover to the next catalytic stage. This next slide, you'll see a, uh, a picture of a demister pad. Um, most important aspect here is that whenever the SRU is down on an extended turnaround, um, the end caps of the condenser should be removed such that the integrity of the mesh pad can be verified. Extremely important. Um, best practice design suggests that demister pads should be installed in all condensers. Um, from experience, that is true. However, we find that most facilities have a demister pad only in their final condenser. Um, if you can only have one demister pad, you know, ensure that it's in your final condenser. For facilities that do not have a tail gas cleanup unit downstream of the SRU, um, sulfur vapor carryover from the final condenser will go straight to your incinerator or thermal oxidizer, and that is inevitably taken as a recovery loss in the form of an SO2 emission. There are challenges with respect to condensers in terms of operations that are too high and operations that are too low in terms of what was my unit designed for, how much sulfur, typically in tons per day, was the unit designed to process. If we are pushing the envelope, we could be processing gas at velocities that are too high for design. As a result, if our gas velocities are too high, some of the liquid sulfur that is forming in our condenser tubes could be carried or pushed across to the next catalytic stage because the velocities are too high. Um, we regularly conduct capacity evaluations for our clients in terms of this is our unit, this is what it was designed for, this, these are our current operating conditions, how are we performing? Um, at the upper limit, there is a maximum acceptable process gas mass velocity of 5.5 pounds per second per foot squared. What is factored into this is the cross-sectional area available from your tubes and your current operating conditions in terms of overall mass flow rate through your system. Too high a velocity, you could be at risk of potentially pushing or overloading the condenser, and as a result, sulfur vapor will carry over the next catalytic stage. At the other end, um, sulfur fogging can sulfur fogging can exist due to high turndown conditions, more specifically, low gas velocities. If you can imagine, if our rates are so low, um, the time spent in a condenser tube is very long in the grand scale of things. Liquid sulfur droplets can actually form midstream instead of along the tube walls and again be carried out with the process gas. And these droplets can be so small or so fine that even having a demister pad will not be sufficient in terms of capturing or knocking down these fine droplets. And again, we're carrying over sulfur vapor to the next stage or the next catalytic reactor where we have an equilibrium limited reaction. So we are dumping product into a reaction scheme that is equilibrium limited. In theory, maybe the extent of reaction wouldn't be as high as we would like in, the, in that next catalytic stage. Um, these are typical calculations and analyses that are conducted in uh, you know, a pretty standard offer, offering for us, the SRU capacity evaluation. Most clients have this done every, every several years, and um, especially when uh, there are significant process changes that might be occurring 
moving forward, such as an extreme drop in H2S quality fed to the SRU. Sulfur accumulation, why? We've talked a lot about we've talked a lot about how depending on our operations, we can have, hopefully not, but we could have a high degree of sulfur vapor carryover to the next catalytic stage or in our final condenser downstream towards our thermal oxidizer or incinerator or towards our tail gas unit. Um, operating temperature of the condenser is very important in terms of minimizing any carryover. We've talked about the process gas mass velocity through our condensers being too high or being too low can be detrimental. And we've also talked about how we need to verify when we can the integrity of the mesh pads that at a minimum should be present in our final condenser. Now, anywhere that sulfur can set up um, dead spots, uh, sulfur can pool, um, regions where regions where maybe heat tracing or insulation or jacketing has failed. So anywhere where any cold spots can build up. Because we're moving sulfur vapor around in our process, there is the potential for it to set up and accumulate. Um, when we do visit site, um, it can be overwhelming. Um, you know, there are so many steam traps. You know, how do you manage everything? I know that, you know, maintenance teams have their, have their standard um, uh, preventative maintenance checks. But, you know, as an engineer or operator in the field, um, you know, if you just focus in on the SRU, um, from experience, there's always pieces of solid sulfur around the unit. And uh, to verify the operation of a steam trap, you know, more specifically tied into uh, adequate and effective heat tracing and jacketing on your process gas and liquid lines. If a steam trap is operational, um, if you drop a piece of solid sulfur on the outlet of the steam trap, if there is flow, the solid sulfur should melt. Uh, again, an easy check. Uh, for those that are in the field dealing with the SRU on a daily basis. Sulfur is extremely unique. The picture you see on the right is, um, is liquid sulfur um, that has left the condenser. It has moved its way through the seal leg and it is headed towards the sulfur pit. It looks like we have a nice flow. Uh, the color is adequate. It looks like a nice amber beer. However, temperature control throughout the SRU is absolutely imperative. If we look at this plot, this plot shows on the y-axis the viscosity of sulfur as a function of temperature. The definition of viscosity is the resistance to flow. So if we have a high viscosity, our flow characteristics are not good. We see that there is a maximum in the viscosity curve around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. This corresponds to a temperature of approximately 150 to 155 degrees centigrade. We have a maximum. If we move down to the left, we have a minimum at approximately 300 degrees Fahrenheit, um, somewhere between 130 and 140, or maybe do even 145 degrees centigrade. In most units, low pressure steam, specifically 50 pound steam, which is about 300, and 300 degrees Fahrenheit is utilized for heating and jacketing purposes. So that is why 50 degree, degree steam is used because from a sulfur viscosity perspective, we are near the minimum in this very unique sulfur viscosity curve.
sulfur fires. So we talked about how sulfur could accumulate in our system. When operating, in general, the SRU will be will have essentially no oxygen in it. However, there are units that employ oxygen. For example, um, you know, there are reheaters before each catalytic stage such that the approach temperature of the process gas headed towards the catalytic stage or reactor is ideal. Direct fired reheaters take a portion of the acid gas fed to the SRU and, and burn with air to achieve the desired inlet temperature to the catalytic stage. What happens if the air valve or meter is not accurate? We could be introducing oxygen to our system. Uh, to prevent fires, there are typically air purge lines, sometimes nitrogen, in advance of each catalytic stage and even the reaction furnace. And depending on your procedures, best practice shut down or startup procedures of an SRU involve cutting off our acid gas and burning fuel or natural gas in order to melt out and push out with high mass flow rates all the sulfur that is remaining in the system such that we can safely evaluate the different units associated with the SRU on an extended turnaround and in general the success and safety of an SRU startup is directly proportional to the quality of shutdown that took place. There is very increased risk of introducing too much, too much oxygen to our system when we are conducting a proper SRU shutdown or startup by way of burning fuel or natural gas. Basically, what we have is any sulfur that has accumulated in the system, whether or not it be sulfur vapor, liquid sulfur that has maybe pooled somewhere in our process gas lines or units, and also solid sulfur that's formed due to cold spots in our process with the temperature of, with the temperatures achieved during a SRU shutdown or startup by burning fuel or natural gas, that sulfur solid sulfur can melt we form a liquid temperatures get high enough we could also form a gas basically sulfur plus oxygen forms so2 and an extraordinary amount of heat so when we talk about sulfur fires it's really the formation of so2 and that heat of reaction that's generated or released upon that reaction so we have risks associated from extreme heat generation upon the start of a sulfur fire and also the formation of SO2. That is an emission. Our emissions will increase exponentially. Also, SO2 plus oxygen can produce SO3. Uh, in general, SRU operations, these processed gas streams contain approximately 30% water, of course, in the vapor phase, we hope. But again, any cold spots or opportunities for things to mix and pool, that SO3 and water can form sulfuric acid, and that leads to enhanced corrosion potential. Now, of course, to have a fire, we, we need a source of ignition to complete that fire triangle. Um, sulfur itself has an auto ignition temperature of 230 degrees centigrade. Uh, depending on what we are doing, we could definitely hit those temperatures. Um, you know, where else in the process can we have a source of ignition? Some facilities use direct fired reheaters in advanced of catalytic stages. There you would have very hot reheater tubes potentially two uh, significant photos the one on the left is not necessarily representative of a sulfur fire but it is representative of what not to do when operating the sru 
this picture was taken from a facility in northern Alberta here in Canada. And uh, this facility no longer operates today. Um, in Alberta, one of the main challenges that uh, SRU operators face is the fact that our gas wells are not as sour as they once were. Um, H2S, overall H2S content is declining. As a result, some facilities don't have sulfur levels anymore that require the extensive capital associated with um, setting up a sulfur recovery unit. Acid gas injection right back into the ground is becoming more popular and common here in Alberta. But anyways, the story here is that what you're seeing here is a melted incinerator or thermal oxidizer stack. Something happened, whether or not there it was an SRU issue or the wrong valve was opened. But essentially the acid gas was routed to the thermal oxidizer and it had extremely high H2S content. And this picture really illustrates the the heat that is released when we burn H2S. We literally here have a melted incinerator stack. And the other picture on the right is a picture of a sulfur fire coming out of a sulfur pit. Um, liquid sulfur that is formed in the SRU inevitably contains H2S that is trapped or entrained, if you would, in that liquid. Um, the sulfur pits have different processes employed or a suitable retention time such that that H2S can be released with time from the liquid sulfur. And it is swept away by, a, by an airstream and taken towards the thermal incinerator. So here something went wrong and we have a sulfur fire. So essentially a lot of heat generation and what you see there in the plume is, is rich in SO2. So we want to avoid those situations at all costs. Touch briefly on the very importance of understanding what goes into a safe, efficient, shut down and start up of an SRU. Because we know that sulfur can accumulate in the system and upon introduction of oxygen during these procedures, it is imperative that we flush out all sulfur from the system. And again, the, the success of a startup or a restartup is directly proportional to the quality of our shutdown. Uh, there is an inherent risk of passing too much oxygen too soon. Um, a properly defined and carried out shutdown procedure will involve cutting off your acid gas feed at a certain point and starting to burn fuel or natural gas such that we achieve high temperatures throughout the SRU to melt out and revaporize any sulfur that might have formed in the system and also to have a, an excellent or high mass flow rate through the entire system to push out all sulfur that may have set up, or if we were running at high turndown conditions, there might have been some channeling that might have occurred through our catalyst-packed reactor beds. But in general, we need to flush out all sulfur from the system. The risk is, is introducing too much free oxygen to our system because it, for without a doubt, contains sulfur in it somewhere. As a result, accurate metering of both our combustion air and fuel gas is so imperative. For a 100% stoic burn of a fuel gas stream that contains 100% methane, we're looking at a ratio of about 8.5 to 9.5 to 1. Now, depending on how accurate your meters are, and we've been out and performed these analyses for our customers many times and in one example due to inaccurate metering that that nine to one ratio was really 28 to one with all that in mind many operators do retain third-party shutdown and startup assistance for these reasons 
we want to make sure that that we are not introducing too much oxygen into the system such that we minimize sulfur fires and that we have the appropriate fuel gas burn or sweep such that we are not sending free oxygen into the system and at the extreme other level if we are burning too deficient not enough oxygen we could start cracking the fuel gas if you would and it creates what we call soot that will set up on top of your reactor beds and upon restart up we will not be able to move the amount of process gas through the system that we expected you would see a buildup of pressure at the front end of your SRU the bottom line is that at all costs we want to prevent sulfur fires such that we protect your personnel your process and your bottom line because there's nothing like having to take additional downtime coming out of a turnaround that might last six weeks every three to five years the 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 impact or costs associated which with such an event are huge for more information on um, shutdown and startup procedures and options again feel free to visit our website sulfurrecovery.com um, in the chat box i have included my email and um, we're here 24 7 to answer any operational um, questions design questions or concerns and also to discuss or review your SRU operating procedures. In general, when operating the SRUs typically operate quite steady. Um, performance is directly proportional to what is happening upstream in the amine or gas treating units. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the issues associated with the accumulation of sulfur in the system. Also, some of the challenges or the impact of, of carrying sulfur vapor to the incinerator, which would be taken as a sulfur recovery loss as an SO2 emission. Also, how the carryover of sulfur vapor to the next catalytic stage inevitably will impact the extent of that equilibrium limited Klaus reaction. The SRU is not a direct moneymaker. Right now, the price of sulfur is low. Um, as a result, the SRU is often neglected. Um, turnarounds typically occur every three to six years. Uh, in the operating ranks at most facilities, there's lots of turnovers in operators. Um, you know, at times, um, you know, that, that transfer of knowledge or experience, I think it could always be better. As a result, um, you know, we are always here to, to assist, um, to answer any questions you may have to review procedures and to train employees. The importance of operating the SRU under optimized conditions is so very important because the SRU is directly tied to emissions, uh, which is tied directly to the environment. And expectations in terms of performance and emissions are only getting tighter. Finally, if we have issues with our SRU, if our SRU goes offline due to temperature excursions and sulfur fires, that means that the rest of our facilities or units are down. Those are the money makers. So indirectly, the SRU is the big money maker and the importance to understand the details under the hood, if you would, with respect to operating safely and optimally. With that, I will conclude the presentation portion of this webinar.
Um, for more information, feel free to send me an email at any time. And please do visit our website, sulfurrecovery.com. Um, you will learn more about our services and our offerings. You should also register for our free quarterly newsletter. Um, always includes good information and a couple articles each newsletter that uh, focus on uh, questions and feedback that we receive from our friends and colleagues. Um, and also we have an SRE quiz. So um, challenge yourself. We'll see, uh, challenge yourself in terms of your own SRU or aiming gas treating knowledge. With that, um, I will formally open the floor for questions. Um, there is a question tab under your webinar panel. Um, there were some questions that were written up uh, in advance of the webinar even starting. I will begin to address those. Um, if you feel like you need more information, uh, with respect to your specific question, um, feel free to send me a gentle reminder via email, and I would be happy to provide a more formal response either by way of email or we can set up a phone call. I will go through the listing and the questions tab first, and then I will unmute all of the, I will unmute you all such that. Uh, you can just ask me any questions once we get through the question tab first. The first question that I have is, in our SRU, there is no ESD, so emergency shutdown device, in the sulfur condenser level, LL, so low level. It is important that it is so very important that the level of boiler feed water, for example, in our sulfur condensers are where they should be. Any type of safety device, level transmitter, or indicator associated with our condensers need to be verified and accurate. Um, I believe that our next webinar will talk about the operation, same type of idea, but associated with catalytic reactors and converters. And we will see that that temperature control in terms of best promoting that close reaction is so very important. If we have an extremely low level in a sulfur condenser, we will not be able to remove the amount of heat from the process gas stream that we need to. Thus, we will have a high, much higher degree of sulfur vapor carry over to the next catalytic stage. It will impact the close reaction greatly. Now, from an equipment or tube integrity perspective, we need appropriate levels to remove that heat, or we will definitely jeopardize the integrity of our equipment and condenser tubes. Again, if you would like more detailed information with respect to that question, please send me a gentle reminder. We have a comment that um, our process has a is CBA, so cold bed absorption in tail gas where the front end is a close reactor. I believe this is tied into the question uh, prior in advance in terms of, you know, ensuring that our level indication on our condensers is working and accurate. Independent of what type of SRU process you employ, it is so very important that, especially in a condenser, especially in your waste heat boiler. If we go low, low on level, that must shut down the SRU. Um, one other question here. In our sulfur pit, our level indication, so the level of liquid sulfur in the pit 
was to maintain 70%, but now it is to maintain 55%. What is the effects in case of fire in the pit? Sulfur level in the pit will not necessarily uh, increase or decrease the risks associated with creating a sulfur fire in the pit. This is a good thing to discuss more offline, but the risk associated with sulfur pits and sulfur fires is that we have a level of sulfur in the liquid form, and most facilities will have a sweep gas, air, coming across the pit to remove to remove any of the H2S that with time, specifically with time degassing of the H2S from the liquid sulfur, to carry that H2S out of the pit such that we reestablish the driving force of a high concentration of H2S at the liquid vapor interface such that we can remove more H2S from the liquid sulfur. Now, level of the sulfur pit really potentially impacts the ability or the efficacy of degassing, removing H2S from the liquid sulfur. Um, it all ties into residence time. If you, if you ask for less level control, you will have less residence time in your degassing pit. Now, depending on what type of degas, formal degassing strategy that you employ, um, it turns into how much H2S is still remaining or trapped in our liquid sulfur product. Uh, we do on-site liquid sulfur analyses um, in general for a uh, properly designed and engineered degassing system, we would expect less than 10 parts per million H2S remaining in that liquid sulfur product. Another question, in case of a fire in our sulfur pit, what should be the snuffing steam flow rate? Wow, that's a good question. Let me circle back with me via email, uh, Mr. Mystery, and I will find out if there are specific guidelines with respect to a specific flow rate. Um, you know, if there is a sulfur fire, the remedy is to, yes, introduce snuffing steam uh, in the heat of the moment. Um, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that the operating team would be necessarily worried about a specific flow rate. They will open the snuff steam valve, but but let me explore that further, and I, I can definitely get an answer for you. Can you explain again the reason why we need to operate near dew point? not above. Okay, I'm going to reform that question. The reason why we want to operate our Klaus condensers near dew point is that the cooler that we operate, in theory, the more sulfur vapor that we will condense and form liquid sulfur and remove from the process. Thus, the cooler that we can operate, the less amount of sulfur vapor that will be carried over to the next catalytic reactor. And we talked about how the reaction, the Klaus reaction occurring in that reactor, reactor is equilibrium limited. We are trying to make sulfur vapor here. So we don't want to be adding any product to that reaction scheme. It will, it will inevitably push the reaction to the left. Overall, most likely, the overall extent of the Klaus reaction in that next stage won't be as high. We don't want to operate below the sulfur dew point because if we operate below the sulfur dew point, we are at extreme risk of forming solid sulfur. Um, if we form solid sulfur anywhere, 
for example, uh, we start forming solid sulfur in our condenser tubes, you will see with time the pressure will back up in our system and we won't be able to push the amount of gas through our SRU as we had planned. Temperature control, especially in condensers and especially in our catalytic reactors where we're trying to best promote that close reaction is so very, very important. Now, that is all the questions that are listed in the question panel. Um, I hope that I covered everything. Uh, for those that would like additional information, for those who ask those specific questions, if you need more information, do not hesitate to email me. Uh, under the chat button, I wrote in my email. I will write it again. It's Ryan M at sulfurrecovery.com. And to close up, I will unmute. And if you feel comfortable or would like, if you feel comfortable or would like, you could ask me a question directly from your computer. And upon that, that will conclude our webinar. Um, you will, via email, receive a recording of this webinar, so you can go back and review, and uh, by all means, share with your uh, with your colleagues and counterparts back in the office. And uh, upon closing out the webinar, um, it would be greatly appreciated if you could complete our quick survey. I believe there's four multiple choice questions, uh, just to get a better feel of of uh, you know what you are looking for uh, in terms of future webinars, uh, what you thought of this webinar, and you know in any way that we can help ensure that your operations are safe, reliable, and optimized. With that, I will unmute everyone and see if there's any final questions. <laughs> Any final questions? I don't think so. So thank you for attending the webinar today. I hope it was uh was valuable for you. And again, don't hesitate to contact us with any questions, concerns, and uh, recommendations. Again, thank you for your time and have a great rest of your day.